and welcome to episode number 221 of the LSR podcast. My name is Matt Brown, joined each and every week by the brightest minds in all of the gaming industry. With me, I have Adam Candy, I have Pat Evans this week here on the Legal Sports Report podcast. And you can find these guys over in their awesome, awesome words. Pat does a really great job over at Legal Sports Report each and every week. So be sure, take in his hard work and all of the words that are going on to the site over there this week. We will talk about what's going on in New York. We'll talk about some Arizona stuff. We are going to go state by state and talk to Pat about what he thinks is going on in all of some of these states that we have some question marks around. But Pat, let's go ahead and kick things off here. We do have a new problem gaming bill in Congress. Yeah, and this is the U.S. Congress. I mean, you know, listening to state by state level everywhere, everyone seems concerned with the rise in problem gambling. And Richard Blumenthal and Andrea Salinas uh, have introduced a new problem gaming bill to address research and addiction treatment uh, using the sports betting excise tax 0.25% on the overall handle. Uh, and, you know, it's something we're going to see if it moves anywhere at the national at, in, in Congress, but um, it's certainly showing, and they cited Richard Blumenthal cited the rise in sports betting in, and how that's contributing to a national rise in problem gambling. And this is one way to, you know, take action to, towards fixing that. Um, it is to be noted that the American Gaming Association and several other um, politicians are, are not exactly in favor of this bill. I mean, Dina Titus in, in Nevada wants to completely get rid of the excise tax. So, um, again, this is something we're seeing at a state level, lots of concern of the rise in problem gambling, and, and it's rising up to the national level. Um, and this is not the first time Blumenthal's kind of cast his weight behind something that the responsible gaming world, uh, you know, last year he sent a letter uh, concerned about the college partnerships and sports books. So, uh, yeah, this is not the first or last time I think we're going to see something at the national level uh, addressing problem gambling. Adam, you and I long talked on this podcast about making sure that we're doing everything the right way, doing responsible gambling, responsible gaming. We've also talked about the fact that it's not just necessarily a, oh, there's more sports betting, so obviously there's more problem gambling. We've also highlighted the fact that, hey, these sports book offer you the opportunity to self-exclude if you want to do that. There are certain measures in place within if they see some odd and sp suspicious activities that are going on. Uh, one of the things we definitely have not been able to do in the past before there was legal sports gambling was, your bookie was still taking your money. <laughs> like your, like your, your, the, the offshores were still taking your money. Like that was just going to happen. Right. And so we at least have a little bit more in place now already with it being legalized, but this is just taking some of the stuff a step further. If you go back over the course of 220 previous episodes, you'll hear a lot of us saying that legalizing sports betting at the state level is not just, and frankly, in some cases, shouldn't be at all about trying to fill budget holes with the tax revenue that comes from sports betting because it is volatile in terms of how much you will be able to gain off revenue each month based on the results that you get from how people bet. What we did say in all of those episodes as well is that part of the argument for regulation is the ability to better address problem gambling and to better have a light shined on those who need the treatment. Now, I get where both pieces of this are coming from on the congressional side, where Senator Blumenthal is putting forward legislation to use that excise tax money for what is ostensibly a very good cause. I also understand that Dina Titus has had a quest for quite a while to get rid of the excise tax. And I think I find myself landing a little bit more on the Blumenthal side for this reason. We've said forever, Matt, where does this tax go? What does this money do? It's a drop right. in the bucket when it comes to the federal budget, right? We're talking about an amount of money that means nothing in the grand scheme of what the United States has in its coffers. But if we're actually going to take some of this money and put it towards something that is absolutely necessary, then yeah, then I have less problem with the federal excise tax than I do with what it is right now, which is just an antiquated notion that's been out there for a long time that no one has done anything well. I think you could make a very good case to say either get rid of it or do something good with the money, and this seems to be at least a step in the direction of doing something good with the money. 
Yeah, Pat, that's kind of the been the biggest thing about all this. And the reason Dina Titus has, has been on this crusade against was just the fact she's like, where's the money? Is there like a, a Scrooge McDuck vault somewhere where all this money is like just sitting and like there's someone swimming in it? And like, 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 like where is this money? Where is it going? What's it being done? So like, she's kind of like, listen, if we have no plan for this, then it's just pointless for us to keep taking this money where there's absolutely no plan. So I, I'm, I'm with Adam. It's like, if there is a plan, cool, fine, keep it. If we are not going to come up with any sort of plan, yes, get rid of it because it's just it's it's ridiculous to have something where we're just oh yeah we're going to take this money what are you doing with it eh, <laughs> eh, eh, we'll figure, eh, whatever we'll figure it out yeah I mean it's I, I think it's about five hundred million dollars since twenty eighteen which again to Adam's point is not a huge amount of money in the the greater scheme of American uh, budget um, but yeah I, if you're gonna take it you might as well put a good use to it and and under Blumenthal's plan it's uh, about I think it's 75% to the states uh, and, and 25%, my percentages are probably off, I'm not looking at it at, at the moment, but to, to national uh, research. So it's it's good, you know, for those things, it's probably a lot of money, but for the broader general fund where it's going right now, it's not. So yeah, if it's, you know, if you're just throwing it to the general fund, you might as well get, you get rid of it and provide sports books a little bit more money to combat offshore, you know, make their product more appealing. Mm-hmm. Or if you're still going to take it, make it useful for the industry. Adam, let's head over to New York. And, you know, we talk the vast majority of the stuff we talk here about on here is sports betting. But we do hit the DFS angle for some for some of the stuff. When there is poker news, we talk a little bit about the poker news out there. And certainly we hit iGaming news whenever that is available to us as well. And so a little bit of stuff coming out of New York from that. Yeah, and look, this is not the first time that we've talked about iGaming and New York. There was a bill that dropped last year from Senator Joe Adabo, and it really didn't go anywhere at all. And we're kind of in a similar spot this year where there's another attempt, but the governor did not include iGaming in her budget, and that is going to put a major crimp in trying to get anything done. So you've got a 30.5% tax rate on iGaming in this bill from Senator Joe Adabo, which might sound like a lot until you remember what New York's sports betting tax rate is at 51%. And I think the most important thing to keep in mind with this story is that iGaming legislation is not going to be the straight line that a lot of sports betting legislation has been. It is a much harder sell in terms of those who have responsible gambling concerns. It is a much harder sell for casinos who are counting on people coming through their doors to play and don't want to deal with the unknown boogeyman of whether online casino will take away from that. There's a lot of research that shows that it's additive. However, uh, try taking the games that they're used to having everyone come into the casino to play and throwing them on a phone and telling them that they'll still be able to make money in terms of the entire ecosystem of what a casino is, and that is going to be a very hard sell. So I think with these iGaming bills, what you're going to see is that it's going to take multiple years, it's going to take multiple iterations, and there are not going to be as many states that ultimately pass iGaming bills. But for the long-term viability of the standalone sports betting operators in particular, like the DraftKings and FanDuel of the world, it is important that they expand the market when it comes to iGaming because there are only a handful of states in the United States right now that allow for it, and those states have been robust. Yeah, Pat, in the, in the grand scheme of things, right, the, 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 the true upside play for all of these companies is, is iGaming, right? I mean, we know that sports betting, sure, it's nice, but it is, a, it is still a small margin business in the grand scheme of things, and the iGaming has the infinite upside. And I'm sure if we were to talk to people who are investors in these companies and all these things that are talking about long-term future, you know, what is the long-term aspect and, and what we might be looking at, it's always the iGaming factor that's kind of lingering out there because should that even pop in a few more states even, right? I mean, even a few more states is a significant revenue uptick for these for uh, for these companies and certainly New York, the size of New York would would be huge. Yeah, New York would be huge. Uh, but I, to 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 all of this, I mean, I was just down at the National Council of Legislators from Gaming States. It's a mouthful down in Florida. There's winter meeting, <laughs> uh, and just last summer we we heard a lot of okay, iGaming's next. We can tackle this. We can get this passed in in quite a few states. 
know, whether it was Indiana, Illinois, New Hampshire, New York, we're looking at Maryland as well. Um, you know, this next year could be huge. We've already seen Indiana and New Hampshire fall off uh, kind of quietly. There, there's basically no chance anything happens there. Um, Maryland's a, a, a state that a lot of proponents are very excited about, but I just watched a study yesterday or a study hearing yesterday that the politicians are raising similar flags uh, that we've heard from in the past, uh, whether it be diversity and inclusion, which is huge in Maryland uh, in everything they do, uh, to uh, you know job loss at bricks and brick and mortar casinos, uh, and and problem gambling uh, jumps uh, they're worried about. So. You know, we're seeing this, and, and so then at the meeting this, this month, it's been, you know, the stakeholders have rolled it back a little bit of being really bullish and saying this is going to be a multi-year chip away at it uh, rather than we're just going to get it done in, in one full swoop like many of the sports betting states. And and we'll see how long it those, those chipping away takes, but uh, a lot of it's not looking good this year. Yeah, Adam, um, I'm sure – if we started listing off between the two of you, how many uh, mouthful conferences that you guys have been to over the last five years, we could probably get some really interesting ones going on here. I know that you like to come back with the seven word conferences that you've gone to here recently. Like that's one of the things you like to talk about. There's a reason that when we talk about the conference that Pat just mentioned, we say nickel G's and it sounds like <laughs> a dive bar that you went to in your college town. <laughs> oh, nickel G's that $5 yeah. beer night. Oh, oh, I loved yeah, it. Right. Yeah, was am- oh amazing. my God. I used to, I used to get hammered at nickel G's. That was my favorite. Uh, so it's amazing. a lot easier than saying all those words that Patrick said. <laughs> it's, it's great. I love I, anytime y'all come back from a conference and you're just like, yeah, so I went to the South Central and North American sideways up and down, left and right, <laughs> uh, ca- uh, include Canada gaming conference this year. And then whatever, it's like, oh, all right. Yeah. All right. Interesting. That's fun. Who was there? Uh, well, <laughs> yeah. I mean, so we'll, we'll go, we'll go and do all that.